This is Jay Michaels, and I'm here at Boston Sci-Fi. Now, that's not the whole title of this amazing event. It's Boston Sci-Fi 47. That's right, nearly a half a century of this amazing film festival bringing us films that are futuristic, that are entertaining, that, uh, uh, that are terrifying sometimes in their vision. Uh, and and uh, as much as we've had a great time speaking to the filmmakers, I wanted to talk to those that have sat in the audience and have witnessed this amazing, amazing event and how it's changed over the years. And I'm lucky enough to have three individuals with me who, who, uh, who can claim to be authorities. We're, we're first gonna talk to Perry Persoff. Perry, uh, you, you've been with Boston Sci-Fi now uh, since, what year did you tell me? How long? Uh, 2014 was my first one. 2014, so we're eight years with you. I'm a baby uh, in the group. You're the baby in the group now. Now <laughs> I, I teach at university, and and eight years ago, for some of my students, they were they were like in junior high school. So for them, it's a lifetime ago. Uh, now you're you're part of something called the Boston Sci-Fi Sing. Yeah, the the group Sing is I, I guess the latest addition to the uh, the latest ritual to the tradition of the uh, the, the Boston Science Fiction Film Festival. And um, I should first tell you that. Before I started going to the festival, I would drive by the Somerville Theater and I'd see on the marquee the sign saying Boston Science Fiction Film Festival, 24 hour movie marathon. And I think to myself, wow, that, that sounds a little nuts, but that could be a lot of fun. I should do that one of these years. And whenever you say I should do that one of these years, it usually means the next year you get a reminder. So this would go on for year after year after year. And then in 2013, I moved to uh, within a 17 minute walk of the area, walked by the theater, saw the marquee and said to myself, damn it, my best to Forrest Kelly. <laughs> I live right by here now, I can walk here, I'm gonna do this. And so I went to my first uh, thon there uh, for $50. Uh, the next year was the snowmageddon winter and like a normal human being, I cowered inside uh, pretty much the whole winter. And the next uh, year when I was at the festival, I actually admitted that and got booed. <laughs> I feel like it's almost an honor but yeah in 2016 I decided uh, yeah I'm going to go get my ticket a little early so Friday I go into the theater and I ask the box office can I get a marathon ticket for the Boston Sci-Fi Festival now and the person there pointed and said that's uh, we, they just rent the theater you got to go over there and talk to uh, <laughs> the lady at the table there oh okay so it's a table that says Boston Sci-Fi and I asked the young woman there if I can get my marathon ticket uh, early and she says, oh, uh, hang on, let me check with somebody. She brings Garen over. And I thought to myself, this is the guy who does the whole thing. You didn't have to you know, bother him for that. So I introduced myself and I said, I think I met you two years ago at my first thon about 11 at night. Oh, yeah, I remember you. You can't remember me. You see hundreds of people. Yeah, you have a very distinctive blah, 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 blah. Well, thank you very much. So we talk and I tell him that I, I work in radio and he asks, do you play guitar? <laughs> and I sheepishly say, um, no, I have a hard time air guitaring bar chords. And there's this pregnant pause that develops. And for somebody in radio, the pregnant pause, the, the, the deathly fear of dead air becomes like an instinct, even if nobody else can tell. So to save face, I sheepishly say, but I'm a pretty good karaoke singer. And right away he says, hmm. We need someone to help lead a group sing for a David Bowie song. So he tells me about this. They've got a DVD with the lyrics. And uh, I think he's asking me to do this. Whoa, this sounds like fun. Score. I'll get into the festival. I'll get to be part of the festival. I'm in part of the thon. So uh, there is a woman named Adria who was, uh, I guess, uh, one of his veteran volunteers. And so, uh, yeah, I go up there and do the, um, David Bowie's Space Oddity with her. Uh, and that was a really fun moment. Uh, I'm a pretty shy guy, but you give me a microphone and sometimes it's like you know, Pandora's box. So all this other stuff comes out of me. I become a more interesting guy. The next uh, two years later, um, we did uh, we, we did the Purple People Eaters and I could not get the words down. So I had to swallow my pride and go up on stage with a lyric sheet, a piece of paper with my lyrics. Adria had done one better and she really made this one happen. 
she uh like the bob dylan video of subterranean homesick blues she had written out lyrics on placards when i got to the theater she had them all over the front of the stage and would hold them up <laughs> and then toss them off as each lyric was was said and she, she really made it happen and i got one other thoughts of uh, uh, group sing story to tell you uh a, a year or two later she stopped uh, doing uh the uh, the group sing so I, I missed her as my partner there uh and i thought well i guess she's not gonna be here i'll i'll have to go solo uh garen had sort of said in essence i think you don't have to do this if you don't want to and i said no it'll, it'll be fine uh so i'd come up with uh mr spaceman by the birds uh and i said to garen in an email uh, i don't know if i can get a dvd with it but uh with the lyrics for the screen but if not you know, I, it's, it's a course is easy to teach people. So I show up. What's the first thing Garen says to me? Do you have the DVD? I said, no, I, th I thought you were going to take care of the DVD. It goes back and forth like that a little bit. Uh, and then he said, well, what do you want to do? Yeah, I, I can do it. He says in a sato voice. All right. Subtext. It's your funeral. So I go up there. I, I teach the crowd, the chorus, whatever. And the crowd is really into it. The crowd was awesome. The crowd, like always with the thon, really made it happen. And it was a great time. I go off the stage. I, I, I give Garen the microphone. And this is one of the greatest compliments you'll ever get from anybody. First thing he says is not, how about a hand for Perry? Or you were great. He says, that took a lot of balls. <laughs> So he was pleased with me. So those are my favorite uh, group sing stories. But the crowd, like with the thon in general, really, really makes it. And it's it's just a lot of fun. I'm you, very pleased and proud to be a part of it. You you bring up uh, uh, two interesting points. One, the, the concept of fandom. When you are a fan in the fantastical realms, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, it's a real community. It's a real family. And and a group sing, you know, you you... I, I, I can't see anyone saying, okay, here we are at, uh, at the accountant's uh, uh, getaway <laughs> and everybody let's sing. But, but at, a, at a Boston sci-fi or any sci-fi film festival, it, it, it seems de rigueur. And it's, uh, I congratulate you so much on, on, uh, on running this, on doing this, on, on going from looking at a, a marquee to being an integral part of this because it, it can't happen without people like you. So it's, it's absolutely Thank wonderful. You. You bring up the other point, when we think about science fiction films, we don't realize, and I know we're spotlighting it this year, which is great, we don't realize the music, we don't realize the songs that come out of these movies. Uh, I, I remember as a kid singing the song, Beware of the Blob, da, 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 da. <laughs> we, we don't remember, or we don't realize the, the music, whether it's frightening or, or hilarious, that come out of these, these movies. It's really great. And, and ladies and gentlemen, the, the gent that uh, Perry's referring to is Garen Daly. Garen Daly uh, was here from the beginning when, uh, when it was called, it came from the Orson Welles. And we're going to talk about that in a minute with our, our, our next two guests. Um, we're now going to fly all the way to, to Hogwarts. Uh, and, and not many people know this, but Dumbledore had a brother. Uh, he, his name is Professor Bob White. Now, I've had the absolute joy of talking to Bob White uh, over the last couple of years in my involvement in Boston sci-fi. He is articulate, he is hilarious, and he is absolutely brilliant. And in our last conversation, I've discovered he has been part of this in several ways for Bob, is it 44 years? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that exactly. It's been many years, let's say. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I was there at, it came from the Orson Wells, as Robert will mention later on. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the marathon. It wasn't the festival. It was just a wonderful collection of screenings of science fiction films. And we, we all remember this was before, you, you know, you, you saw it in the movie theater or you saw an old copy on television. My best remem remembrance at that was Forbidden Planet and the projectionist, God bless the projectionist, changed the sound for the spoken word and for the electronic tonalities. 
so when the when the characters were, were involved in each other and speaking, it it sounded like a movie. And then when they stopped speaking, he threw a switch. It was like sense around and amazing. And I was like, what's happening? It was fantastic. It was fantastic. So that was my earliest recollection. Let me tell you about my best. And it has to do with that singing thing too. Um, Pre-COVID, if we can say that. I think SF45, whatever it was, it was the, the last time we were... We didn't know. We didn't know what was coming. And uh, um, I was in the festival in the shorts. I do shorts. And marathon day comes. And I'm sitting in the back of the theater. My spouse was in the last row, just chilling, you know. And uh, the, 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 what, the wonderful guarantee gets up and he goes, like, we're running a little short. Are there, are there any of the filmmakers in the, in the house? And you know, here I am, you know, this features and there's all these international people. Have been, and so like, I'm wearing my white jacket. I think I, I raise my hand. Think there, yeah, here I go. Raise my hand, and I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah. and so, Gary goes like, Bob White, come on down. <laughs> and so, this is my dream from when I was a little boy, a little chipmunk. I used to think, oh, to have my movie screened in the at the marathon, and oh, now I'm going to get up on the stage. Here goes the the, the alligator flying by, and so. And I, I must mention, I do walk with a cane. I skittered down this long hallway uh, the, the, between this, the, <laughs> the chairs, and I get to the, I get to the steps, which are about four steps with no railing, and I go one, two, three, whoa, boom! I fall flat on my face. <laughs> I'm wearing, I'm, I'm, I'm like two hundred and twenty. 230 pounds right now. And uh, so one, one person grabs me to help me up and I'm going, it'll take two of you. And so they start to lift me up and I'm going like, I'm alive, I'm alive. <laughs> and poor, and poor, poor, you gentlemen daily, you so I'm like, um, hey, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Doesn't, Mr. B gives me a microphone and he says, well, what do you like best about the marathon? And I, so, I said, oh, I love you. And then, and then he looks, and I'm supposed to do something else. So here I am. I'm, I'm in shock, practically. I've done the Academy Award moment. I've tripped on my dress, and I've fallen in a goddamn... <laughs> and so I start to sing the Rocky Horror Picture Show science fiction double feature. <laughs> and and what, what's the crowd do? They sing. They pick it up. They do the whole thing. And then I'm... Then, okay, then they're helping me leave. And as I go down, there was a young person there who did the uh, sing-along. Um, and uh, he, he goes, you know what my first song is? <laughs> Science fiction, double feature. <laughs> yeah, that was the second group sing. You're, uh, yeah. The great pick. <laughs> well, and that was you, young lad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bob, I have to compliment you. Uh, uh a rousing tale and and the honesty and the vulnerability not everyone would would lead with and this is when i fell on my face <laughs> uh, uh, and and i give you another compliment when uh of course when you rose what do you do do, do you say now nah, i'm a fine i'm fine i'm fine or or, or or ouch no you quote the bride of frankenstein i'm alive alive <laughs> uh how was it to go from audience member of many years to one of the filmmakers, because I think you told me the last how many? Uh, it's been several years that you've now been a guest filmmaker of, this is, uh, of Boston. This is my, uh, my fifth year. Fifth year uh, with a film. How did it feel to go from wow, look at those great movies to wow, that's my movie? Absolutely wonderful. During the early days of the marathon, I think it was 1984. Um, I don't think we had a fest yet, but I wasn't aware of it. I and I didn't I didn't know I didn't know the, anybody there, except I I had a sixteen millimeter print of uh, of a science fiction animation I had done, and I just sent it cold <laughs> with a with a letter that said, you know, it'd be great if you want to show a movie during the marathon. I was like, no response, no response. <laughs> so when I finally um, sent in, you know, five years later, six years later. And uh, it was like, oh, this is the they're taking its submissions and stuff. I was really thrilled that, uh, uh, and it's a first class, ultimate professional 
uh, festival, I mean, they get the glory all over the place, responded with uh, the laurels and, and uh, instructions on how to submit and a congratulatory and individuals who are going to take care of you. Um, and it was like, it was so, it was so cool. When I was a fan, and I still am, you know, you don't just break, cut the umbilical. Um, uh, I remember standing in line. Of course, we all stood in line, come rain or shine or cold, for, uh, freezing, and uh, chatting with some people. The next year, when I'm scrambling for a seat, I end up sitting right next to this couple who met each other at the uh, marathon, fell in love and got married. And so as the years go by, you see community members throughout. And uh, I, the joy of being selected is the joy. You gotta say, gotta say, Harry, you made great photographs. Harry Love's not with us, but he, he captured each um, short uh, festival uh, screening. So there's like six or seven, eight filmmakers in, in attendance. And at the end, we do the, the uh, um, speaking into question and answer and stuff. Always had a wonderful photograph, always all photographs. And they're, they're still on, online, you can, you, can, you can watch them. And those kids, I'll say kids, I'm 76 years old. <laughs> those kids with the movie, we were all thrilled to see each other to celebrate our, um, our our movies and i'm gonna i'm gonna end with like one little story when i'm called up they call up the six of us at, at one of the screenings and the, the young directors and i'm i'm you know i'm shy you know i'm going like i had scotch with scotty and i told a little story about uh, star trek convention and uh, one of the lads goes i met scotty jimmy doing I gave him a hug. And so the two of us look at each other and it's like, okay, we hugged. And so <laughs> we passed the chandelier. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's exactly what, what I was saying with Perry. It's this community. Oh, you met, you met Scotty. I met Scotty. And suddenly you're brothers. I, I, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, 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 and, and uh, it's, it's you, you reminded me actually of, of my entrance into this. Um, uh, it was, I think it was pre, I think it was the year before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, you, you sparked it in me because I remember it was Harry's photographs. I, uh, I do public relations and I work with a lot of genre film festivals and I've, I've, been, I've been clocking horror and science fiction films for, for 50 years myself. And, and I came across Boston Sci-Fi's website and the photographs, and I thought, this looks amazing. Why aren't I involved in this? Long story short, I became a judge for, for a couple of years, and I thought, well, this is really great. I'm telling people what, what I think of their movies, and I get to watch all of these amazing movies firsthand. Really cool. Uh, and then I got further involved and further involved. And now, now, uh, now I'm at that point where I, I look at my calendar uh, sometime around October and I say, okay, what's happening with Boston Sci-Fi? Where's, where's a note somewhere? What are they doing? What are they doing? It's, it's become part of my life as well. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in such good company. And speaking of good company, uh, we have with us uh, uh, now, now, uh, uh, if it, I could I could give several introductions for this gentleman. Uh, the one that the one that I've been giving for many years now is that he is one of the foremost authorities on the uh, American theater and the American musical theater. He has written nearly two dozen books. Much of them are on the topic. Uh, he has been involved in productions on so many different levels. He is a respected member of the theatrical community. And uh, ironically, in, in one of our conversations, uh, he just said, oh, yeah, I'm going to Boston now. I said, for what? Boston sci-fi. Oh, my God. And, and just like the Scotty hug, there we go. Robert Viagas and I became brothers of science fiction because now we, we, I realized he was an admirer of it as well. I had no idea he was an admirer of it for, for many decades uh, within this. Robert, welcome. Tell, tell us about you. I saw you sneaking over and putting on a, a sci-fi t-shirt, equipping yourself with your mug. If there's a ray gun nearby, I'm just going to fall over. Hang on. Let me, let me get my wife to put the ray gun. <laughs> there you go. 
Donna, please bring me one of the ray guns also. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I've, I have to tell you, um, uh, the, the thing that connects the theater and the sci-fi is audience. Uh, it, I respect the people who make these things. I respect the people who put these things together. But you know something? I I've, I've always feel that that the the area that that never gets attention is the audience. We should really train the audience. Audiences are are wonderful. It's a wonderful um, um, phenomenon, a human phenomenon. And I'm writing a book for Applause Books called Write This Way, A History of the Audience. And a lot of it was inspired by my experience at the marathon. Um, I, when I was a kid, I used to watch sci-fi movies on TV. There was a guy named Zachary who used to show the movies, Chiller Theater. They would show uh, these uh, sci-fi movies. I loved, my favorite at the time was the uber campy Queen of Outer Space. About astronauts who are heading to Mars, but instead they land on uh, Venus, which is populated entirely by women. They've killed off all the men. Um, it's 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 just a wonderful movie, and it has Zsa Zsa Gabor because apparently on Venus they speak with Hungarian accents. Um, I just loved doing that, and I love being part of an audience and experiencing things. So uh, my a lot of my background is in theater. I have written uh, not tw not two dozen, but I've written twenty books. But my next two will bring me up to twenty two. Ah, uh, this is my lovely bride, who, who is well armed, as you can see. Um, and uh, thank you, Donna. So I am I'm fully armed and ready for the marathon. Um, um, so I used to, I, I've always loved uh, doing that. And uh, I have a friend who lives in Boston and um, she and her, uh, her future wife, uh, they, they saw the first marathon. Then Martha went to the second marathon and said, Felice, you gotta come with me to the third marathon, which they did. And then they spoke to me and they said, we're having so much fun, you gotta go. So I started going on marathon number four. So I was there for the beginning of Mark. I was there for the beginning of Wheat Checks, Rice Checks. Um, Donna brought me some props. I got some great props. This is my t-shirt from, it came from the Orson Welles. Um, what is this? What's special about this shirt? Look carefully. It's SF10 was 36 hours. It was a 36 hour marathon. We had to stand on line in the ice cold, freezing, snow covered streets of, uh, of where was the, sum, where was uh, the, um, uh, the Orson Cambridge. In Cambridge, thank you. Um, uh, and there was no place to go to the bathroom, but that's besides the point. But I remember uh, my heart breaking when I heard that the uh, Orson Welles had burned, but then they, they moved it briefly to the Somerville and then they moved it to Coolidge Corners where, where it was for many years. I attended all these things. We worked, we used to start planning. You start in October. I start planning for the marathon in March. Uh, I, I, I have a whole I have a whole list of things that I do that that I have a, a standing list of, of clothes that I bring and clothes that I, special clothes that I wear. And uh, sometimes I wear my SF uh, 15 T-shirt, which they used to have themed the th marathons used to have themes. One year it was bad girls was the theme of SF 15. Um, and I used to we used to just have so much fun and. Uh, among the, my, my fondest memories was the first time they showed Planet of the Vampires. Uh, I, I don't know if that means anything to anybody. It's an Italian science fiction movie. Um, and the spacesuits that they wear are the most elegantly designed spacesuits you ever saw. Fine Corinthian leather spacesuits. And the translation, apparently Italian has more... Uh, uh, syllables than English to say things. So to fill in the space in the dubbing, what they would do is they would say the name of the character that you were addressing, Jay, and every line would end with the name of the person they were addressing, Jay. And that's the way the translation went. And the captain of the ship was named, anybody? Mark. They kept saying Mark throughout the film and to the point where... Um, any other film that we would that they would mention with the name Mark came up, everybody would would burst into laughter. And sometimes when they were asking questions, the audience would say Mark, Mark, Mark. And this became a um, 
this became a trademark of the marathon. People say, especially in movies that actually had a character named Mark, that was super cool. They, Garen subsequently showed uh, the film again, Planet of the Vampires, and the audience as, as a group counted their way every time they said the name Mark, because we wanted to see how many times the name Mark was said in Planet of the Vampires. It's 162 times. I, I do still remember that. But we had a whole procedure for, we would get there at, a, what we would do is I would get there first because I, I, ha, I have the most blubber. So I stay warm the way whales in the North Atlantic stay warm. Uh, so I would get there early and get online. And, but there were people who would get there before I did. Uh, and, and so that we, we always had our favorite seat. I don't want to say what our favorite seat is because then people are going to try to grab it. But that was, we had our favorite seat. We always sat in these same seats. Although one year somebody got in ahead of us. And so I had to sit behind a pillar. And I have to tell you, that was probably my worst marathon, having, having to watch the marathon basically like this. Um, uh, Garen used to have a lot of contests and things that he would have at the marathon. And I won several of the contests, I have to let you know. My, uh, my, um, uh, piece de resistance that nobody could beat me with was the alien mating call. I was the chief of alien mating call because I can do this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it well today because I'm on stage, but um, I, uh, I won the uh, alien mating call contest several times. Um, making this uh, because I can whistle in harmony. And that's, that's the sound that I just tried to make. I can actually do it. But um, year after year, we, we, over the years, it evolved. The audience experience involved. One year, Garen showed um, 2001 Space Odyssey at about three o'clock in the morning. And I have to tell you, when you're seeing movies for 24 hours, they have a, they have a rhythm to it. Um, you're very excited for the first 12 hours or so. After midnight, your, your circadian rhythm starts to kick in and your body seems to want to go to sleep. The worst time is from three to six in the morning. From three to six in the morning, it is a struggle to stay awake. Uh, but oddly enough, at six o'clock, Garen throws open the doors, the sun comes in and your body goes, ah, it's a new day. And you have no trouble being awake for the last six hours. But one year he had made the mistake early on of showing 2001 Space Odyssey where Hal was going, I don't think you should do that, Dave. And this goes on and on and on. And pr pretty much everybody fell asleep during that. <laughs> it was just like, it was like that scene in uh, Gone with the Wind with all the, uh, the dead bodies stretching off to the, everybody fell asleep at the marathon that. So now Garen has gotten smart and he puts on ex kind of exciting movies uh, at that, in that time frame. Um, and also they, they evolved, they, they now show more kid friendly things during the, you know, during the daylight hours because people can come with families uh, and you can sit there and watch movies for eight hours, go home and sleep for eight hours and come back and watch another eight hours. Uh, and I think a lot of families have gotten smart about that. Uh, one of the things that I always loved about uh, Somerville um, was the um, Museum of Bad Art, uh, uh, which they had in yeah. the basement. And with, they had a collection of really atrocious, uh, hilariously bad art down there. And one of the great things about it was they had these incredibly um, uh, ugly banquettes. And they were great because you could sleep on them if you wanted to. I always try to stay awake through the whole marathon. As I've gotten older, it's become a little bit harder. Um, and, but then they closed the museum. So now uh, you have to basically sleep on the floor if you want to sleep. Um, I, I, I advise people not to sleep. I try to stay up if you can. Get the marathon cup. This is my SF29 cup. Um, and if you get the cup, it's, it's uh, free refills. And so that helps you get up during the night, not only for the caffeine, but also because then you have to get up and go to the bathroom about 40 times. Um, and that helps keep you awake too. Uh, the, the, you know, I love beautiful old theaters. I, I, I took over writing a column for Playbill. I was, I'm retired as a managing editor of Playbill. I was there for a quarter of a century. And I, um, I, I took over the column that they have called At This Theater, which tells the history of the theater, because I love the old theaters. And one thing I love about the Somerville is they kept it. They didn't twin it. They kept the balcony. They kept the performing space. They respect the theatrical space, they respect the feeling of the theater. And, uh, 
And so I, that's one of the, another reason that I love, just as a theater person, I just love going to the, um, the Somerville because Ian Judge takes such good care of it. And, you know, props to Ian Judge. He's a god, uh, just like Garen. Um, so, um, uh, by the way, I am the currently editor of this magazine, Encore Monthly. It's a uh, theater magazine. Uh, so I have continued to, uh, on with uh, my interest in that, but I, you know, I, I just, I just love going to the marathon. I ask me questions because I, I'll, I'll tell you stories. Uh, I'll try to keep them shorter than this one. This one was, this one was a little on the long side. The happiest memory there. What's if, if you, if, if all of your other stories parted and there's that one memory, what would it be? Well, um, I think, um, I'm not going to say this was my best memory, but it's certainly one of my sharpest memories. One year, Garen decided to show a film called Incubus. Incubus uh, is a film that has two distinctions. Number one, it stars William Shatner. And the other distinction is the fact that it is performed entirely in the made up language Esperanto. Esperanto, yes, yes, yes. Um, and um, it was terrible. It's dark, it's slow, it's boring, and it's in Esperanto. Um, they did have uh, super titles, so you were able to see what they were saying. But you know something? It was, the script was so bad, you might as well not have had it. At the end of the movie, everybody stood up and booed. They booed and they diaphragmatic breathing like, like Pavarotti didn't have the, the uh, diaphragmatic support that these people had when they were booing Incubus. It was just a terrible movie. And we just had such a wonderful time booing that film. That was the one year we were in Cambridge, I think. Was it Cambridge? It was the year that we were that the crowd was separated. We were in a, 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 a doubled movie theater. So half the crowd sat in one theater. Half the crowd had to sit in the other theater. The wall was so thin you could hear them. Uh, you could hear their reaction through the wall. Um, uh, and that was the year that we, we really got into wheat checks, rice checks, because one one crowd became more the wheat checks crowd and we were the, the, the rice checks crowd. But that had happened earlier. Are you familiar with this story, Jay? Uh, the, the year they, no, yes. go ahead, please. All right. One year they showed delightful early on, by the way, they used to show in between the films episodes of um, of serials like like uh, outer space, like Buck Rogers and serials. And you would have the cliffhanger and then you would watch a movie and then you'd see the next episode. It was wonderful. But one of the things that Garen also showed was. Um, uh, Captain Video, which was a, a hilarious kids show from like the 1950s. And their, ad, their advertisers were checks, check, check cereal. And they used, instead of breaking for commercial, they would work the check cereal into the, into the show. And um, they had a scene where uh, they were pushing both wheat checks and rice checks and they would have the box that would turn, it would turn in the camera while they were talking. And one side would say wheat checks and one side would say rice checks. And so the crowd just kind of picked up on this and started chanting wheat checks, rice checks, which they still do to this day, um, uh, except for the fact that uh, there's always some spoil spark. Since then, they've also introduced honey nut checks. And so some, there's always some smart ass who'll jump in and start yelling honey nut checks. But uh, I was there the year that they started that. Um, and and th these are all just sort of wonderful, once again, crowd things. They used to have, people used to um, bring laser pointers and um, the laser pointers that whenever somebody was about to get killed, everybody could kind of figure out who was going to get killed and they would shoot them with the laser pointer. But one thing that I really love, it's like from the old days of vaudeville, when the villain comes in, the audience will hiss. And so when the, the obvious bad guy comes in, this hiss rises from the audience. And of course, when the bad guy's about to do something, you know what we do, right? That's right. We would shoot the bad guy with our ray guns. That's how the ray guns came in, from shooting the bad guys. Um, but they, they, at one time, they had paper airplanes, and they would throw them at the screen, and the paper airplanes would poke little holes in the screen. And they said, please don't bring paper airplanes anymore. So unfortunately, that was something that was fun. That was, it was fun for the audience, but it wasn't fun for the theater owner. So uh, they banned the, uh, the um, paper airplanes. But these were all things that the crowd used to do. They used to unroll a big sheet and everybody would sign their name and they would put little pictures and little reminiscences. And they said, we're going to put this all into a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, time capsule. 
A time capsule, thank you. The time capsule, by the way, was an old vacuum cleaner. Um, it was a literal time clap. I don't know what happened to that vacuum cleaner, but all these wonderful memories are packed in there somewhere. And if Jay, if you could find that vacuum cleaner, that thing is solid gold. Um, from all those years of people writing it and they would spend the whole marathon writing them in. Um, another uh, memory. Um, one year, and of course, very early on, they started showing duck dodgers in the 24th and a half century, very early on. And of course, they come in these metal containers with have reels of film in them. Some, and now they would come straight from the distributor or from the, you know, the, the house, the rental house. Sometimes people wouldn't rewind the film. So one year, yes, one year, duck dodgers came in unrewound. So they said, do we want to take time to rewind this film? Or would you like to watch it upside down and backwards? And of course, the crowd all said, upside down and backwards. So one year we watched Duck Dodgers upside down and backwards. Um, and it was great. That it's sounds like, really cool. I would love to see that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This, this is like a, a, one, of, one of my earliest kind of fan memories is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'm not kidding. I went to see it with my Hebrew school. Oh, uh, and I was a kid, oh. and and all of them were mortified. Uh, 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 they were absolutely mortified. Oh. This is how I knew I was different, because all, <laughs> all of them were absolutely mortified by the whole thing. There's throwing of popcorn, and there's screaming at the mm -hmm. screen, and there's dancing in the aisles. And they were all terrified. And and I just sat there and went, this is so cool. <laughs> so I knew I knew there was something different about me at that point. Mm -hmm. Robert, your 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 storehouse of memories are amazing. Uh, we're going to have many more of these, and and I'm going to grab you by yourself and just say, okay, go ahead. And and something tells me the the well of information that's going to come out of you is going to be absolutely incredible. Uh, Bob White, what do you teach? What what are your, your it's Bob White? It's Professor yeah. Bob White. So what do you teach? <laughs> uh, computer animation and uh, media production film. There you go. Stuff. There you go. Um, we have three very mature people here. And, uh, and- the, Well, so not when the thon is on, that changes. I, was, a, I was about to say that. I was about to say that. I always say I'm a, I'm a 12 year old boy in a 50 year old body. And uh, it's amazing that when you step into an amazing community like Boston Sci-Fi, that these these mature people, these these respected professors and authors and professionals, suddenly just want to sing, grab a ray gun, and 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 bound about the place singing songs from Rocky Horror Picture Show, and there's another ray gun. Uh, the the one memory I'm going to have from this conversation is is uh, a, a renowned author grabbing his phone and contacting his wife and saying, bring me my ray gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're never going to hear that <laughs> again. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for this. Uh, it, uh, Jay, it, if, if I may, may add something really quickly. Please. Just uh, please. Uh, uh, the whole sense of community that is bantered back and forth among the, th the four of us, really. Uh, I have to admit, I felt it very, very strongly last year while recording the group singing because it was the virtual COVID pandemic marathon. And I was imagining myself a year later, meaning now, perhaps getting very emotional at the whole idea of being back in person with folks because the crowd, the crowd, the crowd really makes it. And it is so much fun that, yeah, community. It's, it's all there, and we got to appreciate it last year so much because we didn't have it. I, I think sometimes uh, uh, we should really appreciate tragedy for the joy that it eventually brings. COVID was COVID. We, cannot, we can't sit there and, and try to make light of it. It is a, a powerful, awful thing that, that we have gone through. But now when we look at this year, and probably into next year considering everything, the joy that we're now going to have simply going to a store, simply going to a meeting, simply going to our office, simply going to our class, and going to amazing events such as Boston Sci-Fi are going to be that much more precious because we didn't have them at one exactly point. Right. And 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 Harry, I I I I I I sing the same song that you are. There's my pun. Uh, as as I look forward to every new meeting with old friends 
at this at this juncture. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I, I adore Boston sci-fi and, and now I adore it more and now I'm very jealous and I have to get some ray guns and t-shirts <laughs> and mugs and things like that. Really appreciate you chatting with us and I look forward to many, many more conversations with all of you and many others. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen Jay. very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Bayatu Barada Nikto. <laughs> <laughs>